Welcome back to Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play the first volume of the fast action battle game series, The Bulge. Fab, The Bulge, was released in 2008 by GNT Games and designed by Rick Young. This game supports up to two players and takes about four hours to play. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harsh rules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. Another way you can support the channel is by liking and subscribing. Liking a video helps me understand what content is successful with this audience. As for subscribing, New content appears on this channel first. While you may have found your way here from BoardGameGeek or other sites, in the future I'll also be adding more exclusive content that may only be found here. The best way to be informed when I upload new videos is to subscribe and click the bell icon for notifications. Once again, thanks for watching, and now let's get to the video. Welcome back. Hopefully you're refreshed and we're ready to continue learning The Bulge. In the last episode, we discussed the sequence of play, the reinforcement phase, as well as the admin phase. Now we're going to pick up in this episode with operational movement. However, before we jump in, it's important to understand some key information regarding the game's areas. So let's get started. As we cover more movement and combat rules, it's important to understand an area's current status. An area can be uncontested. This means the area contains no forces or forces from only one side. A quick note, players typically begin the game in control of their respective areas. Control changes when an opponent becomes the sole occupant of an area. An area can also be newly contested. This means the area contains forces from both sides and was uncontested prior to the completed movement phase. A quick note here, newly contested areas are recognizable at the start of the combat phase by the units not yet being face up. And finally, an area can be contested. This means it contains forces from both sides and following a battle, the units are face up. The Ardennes map is carved up into 98 territories called areas. For our example, let's look at Marnock. Each area is identified by its number inside of a colored shape. The colored shape indicates the terrain's difficulty number. However, unlike many war games, terrain difficulty is not related to movement. Instead, the shape indicates defensive features which act as a modifier in combat. We'll talk more about how to use the terrain difficulty number in the combat section of this tutorial. Now, each area may have two types of boundaries. Open boundaries signified by a white line and river boundaries identified by a blue line. For units to move from one area to another, they must cross one of these boundary types using a connection. Open boundaries can be crossed by using a field connection or a road connection. And river boundaries can be crossed by a bridge connection or a road connection. Bridges are not drawn out on the map. They're just assumed to exist along each area's river boundaries. For the purpose of movement, these connections have a cost. Crossing to a new territory using an open field costs two movement points. Using a road costs one movement point. And using a bridge costs two movement points. Units, the game's block pieces, may have special designations such as airborne or mountain infantry. However, the FAB system rules use the unit's primary class. A unit may be a member of the infantry class, they have an X in their military symbol, or the armor class, which has the rounded tank tread in its symbol. Armor units have six movement points to spend. Infantry class, three movement points. When moving units around the game board, it's important to understand there are limits. 
Each area has a stacking limit of two units from each side. There are no stacking limits for assets, which are the cardboard counter game pieces. Players can overstack units by moving more blocks into an area, but be aware, stacking limits are enforced at the end of each phase and throughout each combat phase by retreating any excess units. Units unable to legally retreat to adhere to an area's stacking limits are eliminated. An exception to the base movement rules are for the German player. No German unit, including newly arriving reinforcements, may move more than three movement points or move in a strat move phase unless fuel is available. Each unit moved above this limit costs one fuel from the available box. The only exception to this rule is if the German unit is only moving once to an adjacent area. The German player begins the game with five fuel assets in his available box. When fuel assets are spent, they're placed in the used box and recycled through the selection cup like other assets. There's also a way for the German player to gain additional fuel assets. Each time the German player captures a yellow star objective area, for the first time, he might also capture the additional fuel asset. To determine this, a die is rolled. On a die result of 1, add the captured fuel asset to the available box. This increases the total fuel assets in play to 6. On a die result of 2 through 5, move one fuel asset directly from the use box, or selection cup if there are none in the use box, to the available box. A quick note, once the captured fuel asset is gained, die results of 1 get the same result as die result 2 through 5. And on the die result of 6 through 10, no fuel is captured. These are the basic movement allowances per unit, and the basic costs under normal conditions for moving from area to area. However, there may be additional costs based on the combat conditions of the area. Entering an area that already contains units, whether they be friendly or enemy, costs one additional movement point. Exiting a contested area costs one additional movement point. And finally, let's discuss the greatest movement cost. In World War II, bridges were critical to traversing rivers quickly and safely. Therefore, if an area's bridge is blown, a unit must begin their movement in, in that area and it will cost them all of their movement points to cross the river. Plus, when fording a river without a bridge into a newly contested area, the unit will receive a river assault marker that penalizes them in combat. And now you understand the value of engineers, whether they're blowing or repairing bridges. Now, let's discuss other movement restrictions. First, units are always moved one at a time, with one unit completing its move before the next unit begins its move. Units must stop when entering either an area containing enemy units or a roadblock. Only one unit may cross each river boundary into a contested area each movement phase. It doesn't matter whether the bridge is blown or not. There is no limit on the number of units crossing a river boundary into uncontested areas, even if leaving a contested area. A unit that attempts to cross a river boundary into a newly contested area triggers an opportunity for the opposing side to attempt to blow the bridge. This attempt is optional and succeeds on a die result of 1 through 5. If the bridge is blown, that unit that triggered the attempt may still cross the river if it began the phase adjacent to the targeted area. If the unit does not or cannot cross, it does not pay the movement cost for the area it was to have entered. It instead loses one movement point, but may continue moving. And finally, a river assault marker is placed for newly contested areas where all attacking units cross river boundaries into that area, and at least one of the attacking units crossed a blown bridge. One last note regarding movement restrictions for the German player. As you may recall, the German player's higher echelons each have their own zone. If a German unit departs its own zone and crosses into a neighboring zone, it costs that unit an additional two movement points. Now that we've covered the rules for areas and movement, let's discuss the operational movement phase. 
The phasing player, the player taking the turn, has three options with their unit blocks. A unit block may be moved normally following the movement rules we just covered, or the player may opt for the unit block to remain in position and build field works. Field works are a defensive barrier that can absorb one hit in combat. Or, the phasing player may also assign a reserve marker to the unit. A reserve marker creates movement options for the unit in later turn phases. Reserve marker placement is restricted by zone and the number of counters in each player's available box. For example, the German player may only place two reserve markers on units in zone 5, two in zone 6, and one in zone 7. Reserve markers are often spent off units to conduct strategic movement, which coincidentally is the next phase. Let's take a look. Strategic movement allows a player to use their friendly controlled and supplied areas to greatly extend a unit's movement. To conduct a strategic movement, a unit must be tagged with a reserve marker during the operational movement phase. Then, in the strategic movement phase, units tagged with a reserve marker may move from their starting area to any friendly controlled and supplied area they can trace a path to using road and field connections. Be aware though, they cannot cross blown bridges or pass through contested areas. Once a unit's strategic movement is complete, remove the reserve marker. For the bulge, there are also some limitations to strategic movement. Germany may only strat move one unit per game turn, and it costs them one fuel asset to do so. This unit may originate in any German army zone and may cross army boundaries. American strat moves are not limited except by the quantity of their reserve markers. The British may not strat move outside their operating limits. Now, let's walk through a brief example. The German player wants to strat move an infantry unit in Pronsfield to the front of the German line near Bastogne. With only three movement points, the infantry unit would be able to traverse maybe one area. However, with strategic movement, they can use friendly controlled and supplied areas to move much farther. I've marked these areas with control markers to show the available path. To conduct a strategic movement, first during the operational movement phase, the unit is tagged with a reserve marker. Then in the strategic movement phase, the German player can move the unit. First, let's look at some routes that wouldn't work. German units are not penalized by strat moving through other German army zones, like with operational movement. However, Deerkirk is enemy occupied and this would only allow the unit to reach Sensbelt. A route through Dasburg is also not ideal. The bridges at the river boundaries are both blown. Strat moves cannot cross blown bridges. A route through Lutzkampen has the greatest range. The infantry unit can move all the way to Lalange. However, they cannot move all the way into Bastogne because it is enemy occupied. And now, hopefully you can see the advantages of strategic movement. Next, let's look at some other movement rules as well as some additional uses for reserve markers. What makes learning the FAB system tricky is all the various elements regarding movement. Nearly every phase of a player's turn has an element of movement rules to consider. Let's walk through each phase at a high level to understand the overlying structure. In the operational movement phase, the phasing player has three options for each of their block units. A block unit can be assigned a reserve marker. They can conduct normal movement and spend movement points to cross area boundaries to a new area. Or they can maintain their position with the option to construct field works. Next, in the strategic movement phase, the phasing player may spend reserve markers from their units to conduct strategic movement. This allows a player to move their unit within the limit of supplied friendly areas. For the German player, there are limitations to this. The German player may only conduct one strat move per turn and it costs a fuel marker. The allied player is only limited by the number of available reserve markers. Next, in the combat phase, the phasing player can earn an exploitation marker which allows them to move to one adjacent area during breakthrough movement. However, this is only rewarded to armor units under certain battlefield outcomes. 
First, if the defender is eliminated by artillery fire. Second, the de defender uses a special action to retreat. And third, the attacker's ground fire eliminates the defender with at least one extra hit remaining. Then, if the armor unit passes a morale check, they receive the exploitation marker. The morale check uses the same die result success range of a 1 through 5, but this can be modified by troop quality or if the unit is disordered or unsupplied. It's also important to note that exploitation markers cannot be awarded if the battle was fought with river assault or in the breakthrough combat phase. Now, it's important to know that reserve markers can be spent for other uses than strategic movement. The phasing player may also keep a reserve marker on their unit for later in the turn during breakout movement or roll it over to their opponent's turn so they can use it for reaction. After combat is the reaction phase. This allows the non-phasing player to move during their opponent's turn. If the non-phasing player rolled over a unit with a reserve marker from a prior turn, that unit can now spend its reserve marker to conduct normal unit movement to either an uncontested area or to reinforce a contested area. However, the non-phasing player's unit cannot make a move into a newly contested area. The reserve marker may also be spent to not move and build field works. After reaction is breakthrough movement. There are three ways for a phasing player to move their units. If a unit still has its reserve marker, it can now be spent to perform normal movement. If an armor unit has an exploitation marker, it can be spent to move to an adjacent area. Or, if the phasing player spends a special action, this allows an armor unit to act as if it had an exploitation marker. And, as with other phases, these markers can be spent to remain in position and build field works. Now, any breakthrough movement into a newly contested area triggers combat. This is all resolved in the breakthrough combat phase. Be aware though, this only applies to newly contested areas. If combat was just resolved in an area this turn, a second battle cannot be fought with one exception. A second wave of combat in an already contested area cannot be fought unless the phasing player spends a special action. Combat, whether it occurs in the combat phase or the breakthrough combat phase, follows the same rules. And now that we understand the remaining phases for movement and combat, in the next episode of this series, we're going to look at the combat rules themselves. So be sure you're subscribed and have hit the bell icon for notifications because the next episode is coming real soon. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.